looking for where Andrew Lane Where is Where are the lines going? Right. I think it's for Andrew. It I is think it is too. Lane. and I did uh, test this out yesterday and it worked perfectly fine in his house but for some reason or other the, the battery gods have said no you're not going to work today so unfortunately we're going to have to ask Lawrence to speak very loudly and, and draw near so that you can all hear which will be good. Thanks. Well thank you very much for coming along today. Um, my name is Lawrence Enkin I've lived in the street for just over 40 years and for the early years I lived here, my sister Helen in front of me, she lived here as well. So as Lorna was saying, it was Wurundjeri land originally in the colonial period. This was a huge reserve put aside in West, this part of West Melbourne as a woodland, which later became subdivided by the Melbourne City Council in 1859. There was a great shortage of housing. And this block here, the Capel Street block, which is Capel Street, piece of William Street, W.C. and Victoria Street were sold in four large blocks and a lot of the area was. People held that land for four or five years then it could be re-subdivided each block into 25 blocks. So how much area did those, each of those uh, blocks occupy? Each block was approximately, they're different sizes Marion, but a lot of them are about 5.2 metres across and 20 uh, about mm, 30 metres deep, So maybe? if you're looking at it in acres, might it oh, be I, a quarter of an acre or oh, I think half it an was, acre uh, or...? Of the original... More, yes, each yeah, block. About, about that, yes. About that. So, people came along and I know for sure I was asked to write a history for our local Newport Hotham History Group about 62 Capel Street, in which I live, because the man who built that house bought the land. His name was Thomas Noble for 40 pound. He paid a pound 10 shillings for a license to build and he completed a three room cottage story in six months. So the area, if you've had the time to have a look at the messages sent, the pictures sent from Stephen, there's an aerial, an aerial imagined view that was done in eight, late 1860s of the area, and it shows behind us the site of the Queen Victoria Market was a huge cemetery, most of it. So when this block was subdivided and built on, it was a very quiet, reasonably quiet residential area, the whole block. Then the market was built. Eventually the cemetery was built over and then this area turned into one of the busiest retail areas in West Melbourne. The Queen Victoria Market officially opened Fruit and Veg in 1878. Then every house in Peel Street on the other side of Cable Street here turned into a shop house. Downstairs front uh, wall was knocked out downstairs, glass was put in and then they are all open for business. And originally there were some shops built along Victoria Street up that end which is still extant. So you can imagine it was a fairly quiet street. One of the largest markets in the world opened up and then Peel Street on market days, especially Friday, Saturday, it was chaos with horse and carts, horse and drays, private uh, carriages all lined up, double park, triple park and excess traffic horse and carts coming here. There was so much traffic and so many horses and carts of a night time that scrapers would come into the street and they would remove all the excess manure. 
that was everywhere. So from a quiet street, it became a very busy area. All was well for people, even after it became a market, this was still fairly residential and it became mainly housing stock for people who worked in the market or had businesses in the market. In a profound uh, change started to happen in 19, from 1969, when the Melbourne City Council, with approval of the state government, decided they would knock down the old market, which they saw down at Yale, and build high-rise office blocks there of the whole market site and then that wasn't big enough. It was decided that they would not only build all over the market site but they would take this whole block of approximately 100 properties, demolish it all, have a building going across the road across Peel Street, Spanning Cable Street. This is to be a service to all of those blocks. There'd be a lot of car parking in this street and high-rise car parking and lock-ups. Peel Street would have become like a, a dull tunnel if that had gone ahead. Well, soon after the council had announced that, they decided that they would withdraw every single, that they would compulsory acquisition on every single property in this Cable Street block. Some people moved out straight away, their houses were demolished. Others had own rows of terrace houses or had a vested interest. They fought the council. And meanwhile, the National Trust came in, classified the market, classified a couple of houses in Cable Street, Buildings Victoria, classified all the extant old buildings in Cable Street. Combined Pensioners Association, Convincent Paul, Brothers of St Lawrence, saved the market groups from everywhere. And you can come out down upon the market. So by the late 70s, it was decided they wouldn't go ahead. They would restore the market instead. They would offer all the businesses to the business owners in Peel Street. And this was to become residential street as it already was, but all the residents had to get out. And the council decided they would sell at public auction the old buildings and then where the vacant land was from the pull-down houses, they would offer large swathes here and in Hill Street to the Ministry of Housing. The council wanted to encourage people to live in the city, which we were already doing, but <laughs> everybody for many years, as tenants of the Melbourne City Council, we had monthly leases. So single people were more or less heavy out of the places, families could Day, and then after the houses were sold, they had a month to get out. So, shall we go along and look at some of the housing stock, not all the buildings, just some of it, and we have a few stories about the industry. Are we happy to go across here? Merchant, a successful merchant, Alex Cooper, bought this land and built this house in 1865. He had set it back and he bought the property right back to Peel Street and he built this grand two-storey solid bluestone house with a handsome stucco finish and it's actually three storeys because there's a huge pine lined basement in the area. His descendants lived in the area for many years because Alex Cooper Land Bank, he held on all these terraces here in the same pattern, owned the land there until 1891. He completed them all and then built them as rental properties. So there are plenty of people that had money that just built rental properties and people that land banked and were here to make money. Alex Cooper, successful merchant, his grandchildren lived in those houses until the 1970s when the council had hassled them to sell on and his families have now donated to very to us 
lots and lots of documentation from his businesses, buying and selling his dry goods, his land, properties, everything. We have a lot of his documents from the 1860s and 70s. Move on, when the market got to own this property, it had been used for a number of years as a banana gassing building. <laughs> it was an industrial scale. Bananas were, ripe bananas, were stored. You can see the gap there for a little window. Ripe bananas were stored in there and then they were gassed and the whole building was taped up so the gas wouldn't escape. <laughs> so you will see from Peel Street there's easy access to the back of this property. And yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To write them. So you can have bananas all year round. Um, when Helen and I moved here, there was a young artist living here called Neil Hutchinson, who is now doing a lot of research into the history of this area as well, and he still lives in North Melbourne. He was a wonderful artist, as there were in many of the houses. Very interesting artists, photographers, potters, as uh, all sorts living here. So it had quite a bohemian feel. Then we move on to Alex's rental property here. Very refined, very grand inside, wonderful marble fireplaces, high ceilings, grand cornicing, and this lovely set is booked in by a double fronted terrace which you shall see just up there. For many years uh, this house and the double fronted house that belonged to have been built by Alex Cooper were Chinese boarding houses. Many elderly Chinese lived here for many many years, had very little English but all the Neighbours were loving and helpful and used to help them out when they needed something fixed or a phone call made or something like that. The, some of the Chinese women used to drive through traditionally from the cast iron there would be hooks right along and certain time of year there would be fish drying, another time of year there would be pieces of pork drying in the air and then as we move down the block in the market trade, they would have boxes here, they would have trolleys parked out here all the time. On some of the boxes in midsummer, there would be desiccated um, cabbage, chopped up to dry on trays, and then eggs would be broken into other trays, sunny side up, to dehydrate in the sun. It was some traditional Chinese food from their part of southern Canton. So, it was traumatic for these people to have been moved on, the elderly Chinese. We organised interpreters for them to work with the council. They were eventually moved to the High Rise Ministry of Housing Development near Bunkle Street, uh, Alfred Street, North Melbourne. And we all thought they should have been moved together into another sort of household together. But that was history. At least they still lived in the area. Now here's a very interesting house Alex built at the edge of his open land and it's like a very nice bookend. It's a beautiful old house at one end, these infill houses and then this house to complete his building. So we move along, we can see from the top, oh from across the road, this is the Rob Roy, was built as a Rob Roy Hotel, 1872. Very handsome building, very large, very grand. It was a more select hotel because there was a public bar in this room, kitchen behind it, and on this side there was a gent's salon and a ladies' salon for drinking. And as I say, it's a bit more discreet than some of our other hotels and pubs in the area. Um, 
when we moved here, this building was marked even on Melways and Gregory's road books as a landmark. It was Decker's Restaurant. It was a very, very expensive restaurant. Oh, yes. Hi. Oh, the case of Mr. Decker. Oh, there's a lot of people. Are you doing inspection? Or? No, no, no. So here's a summer. Do you want to buy it? Oh. oh. Sorry. Of course, yes. Well, oh, okay. we live here. We're living here. Yeah, yeah very interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 Can even yeah. Yeah. happen to see the entire country. Very grand. Well, I'll to it. And so Decker's restaurant, very expensive. He had a canopy out here with columns and some plants. It was so expensive. People from the Melbourne Club used to come here. And once a month, they had what they called their special evening over 70s club in the 80s. On those nights, on a Monday night, the over 70s club once a month, the street would be lined with Rolls Royces, Daimlers, <laughs> Jaguars. Over 70s club in the 80s was a select group of people who had over 70 million dollars worth of property or business. <laughs> so we had the real haves and have nots in this street. Yeah. So, if you have a look, you can see pictures of this restaurant online. It's great reviews. And Helen, if I may, a book, a bag. I have here, this property was built, bought by Rain Cowling and his wife, and there's a number of houses that have stored them. Here it is here. If you wish, as we walk along, you can have a look. Ray and his family worked on it seven days a week for about a year and spent in 1992 about $90,000 on the restoration, the cellar and for the rest of the place. So if you're interested, this is pictures that Ray had taken. So this is the marvellous Rob Roy Hotel, obviously built by Scottish nationalists in such a name as Rob Roy. So now if we move along, this This building was where the chefs always lived, or Decker's restaurant. Another dear little privately owned house where the last Melbourne City Council resident was Peter Chen and his family, and they are successful fruit and vegetable merchants in the Queen Victoria market today. Then we have, again, we have infill housing. And there are some pictures you can see online of what it was like before this was just passing around sure. the rain. Thanks. I shall talk a little bit a bit about the infill housing, the social housing. We'll need to later cross the road to get a, the best view. So are you here at the back? Yes. And, yes. Oh, good. Thomas Noble built this house. He was a carpenter from England, 1864. It was just a three-roomed cottage with an attic bedroom in the roof. So he built it in an expensive bluestone brick style with a beautiful ruling and 
the solid stonework because he was a builder and he built many buildings in the area many of them to the formula of his single storied house four years later his family had expand, expanded his business had done better he built the second story rather than continuing it in the bluestone style he was showing that he was up to fashion the italianate style became popular so it has a render called stucco it has its pineapple turns at either side the plinth up the top etc etc you can see from across the road so he was a builder he met people here inside he had very fine uh, Australian cedar cabinetry and pine line kitchen which he built later and beautiful um, dado boards different styles throughout the house so he showcased what he could do and it was so successful that Dr Moore our head uh, medical surgeon I think inoculist yeah. inoculist liked it so much that he had Thomas build about uh, 12 properties in Chetland Street opposite the little park around the corner to Rosalind Street and there's a shop on the corner the very last one called Moore's Cottages when you look at those buildings they are single story they are exactly the same dimensions as this build as his original building here Dr Moore didn't want to go for this expensive touch for renovated properties he went for the stucco finish and here we have <laughs> Mr. Lamberti. Yes. Mr. Lamberti lived here from 1950. Oh. Can I just pass, pass that around quickly? Mr. Lamberti was a fruiterer at the Queen Vic Market. He stored a lot of boxes at the back. He lived here. When the council notified everybody that they were going to com have compulsory acquisition, offer him $18,000 in 1971 take it now or later on you're still going to be offered 18,000. He refused. He refused mail from a council. He refused phone calls. He refused to speak to people who came from the council to plead with him. So <coughs> the years it became political, there are articles written in every newspaper, so it seems they didn't want to be seen to be having an old man. He went into a nursing home. I rented this with my sister. He passed away, then the council finally had the whole block. And then it took them a few years to decide what to do with it. So we'll move along. This photograph of Mr. Lamberti was taken in 1979 by Viva Gibb, who lived in this street. She was a fabulous photographer, took silver gelatine photos. She took photos of all the neighbours one day in 1979. Happened to have Mr. Lamberti's picture. And she lived next door. And a young, with a young family. It's a share household. Our claim to fame is that Helen Gardner, Gardner lived here and wrote her book, Monkey Grip, before she moved to Carlton and Fitzroy, that area for many years. Mr. Dean, who built this house late in 1864, early 1865, originally it was single story. It was single story. He was a builder as well. He specialised in stone and fancy stone work. So you can see his little facade with uh, beautiful sandstone, unlike many of the other properties here. Beautiful sandstone finish, single story. Four years later, like Mr. Noble, he'd done well, he built up 
and it became from a three room cottage to about six room. Mr. Dean had a bit of money and he not only bought this block, but the block behind him. And that is still an historic shop house, if you like. That is now the drunken poet. Oh. If you have a look at that, look at the building, you can see it's an 1860s building that was on, once on the same title as this building. So fortunately, Beaver Gibb, who lived here, took so many photographs in the area. She's passed away now. She left them to the State Library. And now I would like to cross the road so we can have a good view of our social housing. Carefully, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Have you all had a little look at Ray's? Thanks. That's all right. As you can see, this side of Capel Street as well is uh, zoned commercial, residential, so a lot of houses were pulled down. This has nothing to do with the council, pulled down from about the 1950s. First office block here became Santa Lucia House, Italian restaurant and Italian uh, reception centre and here we have the Hoya building that became La Riviera reception centre all very busy on weekends sometimes it came became very hairy in the street if there happened to have been in San Lucia house a Macedonian wedding <laughs> <laughs> and at La Riviera a Greek wedding because <laughs> people would pour out to the streets <laughs> laughing and joking and <laughs> you know, on the horn and if they found out they were Greek and Macedonian yeah. there could be a big brawl <laughs> up and down the street <laughs> over politics <laughs> and we have two little original terraces here that were restored we have original 1872s four terraces there Behind the yellow paint is beautiful hawthorn bricks with a very deep blue glaze on them. So if they are restored, they'd be most beautiful. So have a look across the road at the sway of uh, inbuilt housing, two-storey. It was built in 1991. All the infill housing by different companies. That particular in house infill housing there has now got an architect's classification and in the future it might even get a, a heritage classification because it has a very unusual facade of this concrete sort of colonnade if you like and attached to the building what was interesting when they were first built there was a bit of a Le Corbusier artist touch to the building because every door was a different colour, every window pane was a different colour. So it just gave the buildings a bit more interest and lift. Of course over the years with, Renov with repaint whatever, they've just all done the same colour. So on the left we have more infill housing. That was the last row of terraces to go. That whole that row there of the infill housing before the old houses was, I'll just pass this around if you can quickly look at it, series of single storey terrace houses that were, became by the 80s used as storerooms for the market, some of them. Dry flowers were a big thing in the 70s, there was a lot of dry flower wholesaling done there. There were storage for the market <coughs> vendors there in some of the houses. And there was 
little factories like a moccasin, moccasin slipper factory. So the buildings all had a lot of their facade. The bones of the building were there. They had lovely slate roofs and chimneys. However, because council had ceded it to the Ministry of Housing, Ministry of Housing then were not into heritage protection. So we thought there were many plans drawn up. There's pictures coming along. What it looked like, what it could have looked like if you kept the single story terrace houses and then built two stories on the back. So most of the housing stock blends in well. I think if they painted that another colour, that's the original khaki green with brown, white or grey or something, it just might suit the area a bit better. And it has the kind of interesting tiles yeah. up the top which kind of don't match fit in with anything <laughs> but that's because different contractors built in their own way along the street and so here we can see we look across the road thomas nobles no tom mr dean's house is very unusual because it's a bit like something from new orleans it has a slight taste of French colonial architecture, unlike the others. And when you look up close, you can see he did find bluestone, sandstone, and concrete render for pilasters, columns, arches, the lot. Inside, all the fireplaces are stone, beautiful stone fireplaces, and quite grand grand proportions and stairs inside is a builder to show off his trade. So if we can just move up ahead a little bit. move into this street, never move out again, and it's the same with the social housing. Most families move to young children, just stay and stay and stay. And as you can see from our in gardeners. Yeah. And you can imagine it's a very handy, convenient place for people. If you haven't got much English, it doesn't matter because there's going to be someone at the market yeah. <laughs> that speaks your language. Yeah. Now the people. Then, so who owns those houses? A Ministry of Housing. So it's public housing rather than social housing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we move along the street a little bit. Under cover. <laughs> with very unusual and um, very unusual and original balustrade, wooden balustrade in saltier cross if you like, which is a symbol of the cross of St Dan. Maybe that was a Presbyterian building or maybe they too were from Scotland. <laughs> I'm not sure. They have since became become uh, run by the YMCA, no, YW, YWCA, housing for permanent housing, permanent apartments for women. And then we have the very grand residence, which abutted the shop on the corner, built in 1870s. And just on our right ahead here, you don't have to go Just here, two beautiful terraces, one in fairly original condition, was designed by George Johnson. 
George Johnson designed our town hall and many grand buildings. And if you look up Allison Lane, behind number 83, the man who lived there, Mr. Clark, wanted a little boot factory. So there's a double story, brick, very handsome, brick warehouse at the end of the, at the end of the, back of the property. There. And on the corner, lastly, on our left, fine building was the Prince Alfred Hotel. And if you look at it, you can see where the, on this paved footpath, where the cellar doors are, need to be loaded down. And then it was a Prince Alfred. You can see it has the large hotel windows and inside where the ladies lounge was, there is a small window from the bar to the, where the ladies lounge was. So, we had our discreet pub, the Rob Roy, then we had this one here. Then on the next corner of Victoria Street, there's the Victoria Hotel, 1865. Then there is on the next corner, the Royal Exchange Hotel. The next corner, the Central Hotel. <laughs> the next one is the, now it's called the Public Bar. There was a lot, many more hotels here. There were thousands more people living here. One way for us a bit of privacy and time out was to go to a pub. We had a few pennies to go into the lounge to meet people. Or maybe they were just possibly very thirsty people when they were having a good time. So, basically... 90. 90. Wow. 90, so they were everywhere. Each terrace house maybe had could have up to six, seven, eight children, mum and dad, maybe grandma or grandpa as well. So a snug in a pub was a place just to get away <laughs> from a crowded house for a while. And a lot of what I've said today has been written up by various people of the Hotham History Group. I wrote a paper on the history of number 62 Caper Street. And of course it involved the machinations of the Melbourne City Council, implications of the market being built, implications of the market possibly being demolished. So that's why today we have a lovely set of six houses on the corner, an island of two, and the first house is in the middle, and then towards the other end, a lovely row of Mr. Alex Cooper's. Then there's a whole lot of history of the shops in Victoria Street and then all the shop houses that I said the drunken poet in Peel Street and the beautiful house at 2 Dudley Street on the corner of the block. So people will say to me and to have enough time, oh well you moved to 1981. Have you seen any changes? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, we've got a lot of black marks on our name because we objected to so much demolition in the area. <laughs> and so we have, and now you can see this huge still in our city, originally from the back room, the only high rise we could see was the Maya House, now a Somerset building, which was a tall 25 stories at the time. So, as I said, Open History Group, many people, including Lorraine here, are writing a history of their house, which involves the area. So, that'll be coming out later this year, we hope. We hope at the end of the year, but maybe early next year. At the end year. of the year, so keep your eye out, because there are lots of pictures. Publication is it 20 houses of West Melbourne? Or oh, at least. Oh, fantastic. 20 plus houses of West Melbourne, which go back back then. So I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. Thank you. And thank you. The gods are with us. The gods are with us. So thank you very much. There's more material online. And uh, Elio here. Check Instagram, <laughs> Houses of North and West Melbourne. He's posted a lot of pictures of houses. 
and indeed he did a lot of research. I was reading about one of his houses. Leveson Street, which happened to be the last resident of our great great grandparents, with our great great grandmother's funeral. So a bits were very important. And then Elio found that and it mentioned all their children and other mm -hmm. ideas so about them. Uh, Elio, can address. you speak to the oh, sure. Instagram? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, okay, so it's up called Houses of North and West Melbourne okay. and it's on Instagram yeah, and I sort nice. of post three or four posts a week. Um, I just at night rather than watching television, I, um, I search the internet. I work in IT um, and it's just a hobby and I've lived in the area for 25 years, first in West Melbourne and now I live in um, North Melbourne and uh, yeah I've just found some amazing, like a little story as I'm walking along here, I can't remember the house but um, one of the houses where husband and wife lived in the house um, with their daughter and they had a spare room and they rented it out to a Spaniard um, that like had come out. Maple Street. Yes, and um, the, um, <laughs> what happened was uh, this man was a good looking suave guy and um, a woman was attracted to him but she thought that he was having an affair with the woman and that wife. he was living with, the wife. With the wife. Yeah. yeah, and so one morning at breakfast she came in and, um, and, and shot the, the wife um, in front of the children and the husband. Oh, wow. yes. I can't remember. I'm going to look it up. It's one of them. Yeah, it's one of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the uh, Hostel History Project has events like this. Um, it has talks. We have research groups. Um, and we are open to new ideas and new people all the time, 24-7. And thank you very much, Elio. I'm sure you'll get more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. And thank you very much, Lorna. Yeah, thank you, Lorna. And thank you to Lorna for all the work she has done in promoting people to do research on their houses and their history and for organising, and with Lorraine, the publication. It's been a huge job. So I'd like to thank you and Lorraine for helping us to get all that. Up and out there, so it's there for people to read in the future. Yeah, thank you. If you look at our website, you'll be able to check down Melbourne Street, which is the. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Hatcher, mastermind behind Melbourne Street, which is beautiful. I'm so glad that we missed most of the rain.